I am currently the Queen's Bard of the East Kingdom. And uh, reminder, I just asked everybody who is currently here if they were okay with my recording the meeting. I got everybody's consent. Um, there may be more people coming in, as I said, we'll welcome them quickly as we go. When possible, if you could, if you could stay muted so that we're not picking up, uh, thanks, uh, background noise, but I'll try to pause periodically. If you have a question, you feel like I haven't stopped, feel free to just shoot a chat. I will, I will notice those hopefully. And if I don't seem to, then unmute yourself and just ask. It's all right. So let me get us started. Uh, as said, so this is primarily talking about loot, but with a focus on some practical stuff for people who would like, if they have a guitar, to be able to play loot music on it. Um, so the major objectives are, you should be able to come away from this able to do the following. You should be able to explain to somebody who isn't familiar what a lute is, how it is similar, and how it is different from a modern guitar. You should be able to both for yourself and explain to someone else, be able to tune a guitar so that you can play Renaissance lute pieces. Specifically, I'm focused on um, English Renaissance, Elizabethan music. Um, and I will talk about the different kinds of tablature that are available. The French format, which is uh, similar to Alphabeta, is what I use and what I'm going to be showing you. Um, you should be able to figure out both how to read that kind of tablature um, and understand the different, you know, how that applies to the instrument. Uh, translate that into plucked strings and pressed frets on a guitar. And you should have an idea of where and how you might be able to find loop music online and assess its appropriateness and its authenticity so that you get to make an informed decision about whether this is going to bring you to a level of authenticity or a particular quality that you want. I'll probably also talk a little bit nuts and bolts. My blog, drakethebard.com, I've been talking a lot about loot recently. I have a series, a uh, category, uh, a &S Journey, where I've been focusing for like the past year on different loot pieces I've been learning and various things have interrupted it, but I've been sharing out some of the pieces, including at least one I'll probably show you today and breaking down where I found it. You know, who is it by? What do I know about them? What do I consider the difficulty to be? I usually have some videos of me playing the piece. Um, I'm no great shakes at this, but since my particular goal, which doesn't have to be your goal, is I like to play and sing. I like to try and create a full musical experience. There are lute pieces that don't have any vocals in them at all. There are songs written for voice and lute. And we'll talk a little about that. Um, I like to be able to play and accompany myself on lute. Uh, I feel like that creates a whole bard experience. And that was one of the things I used to help uh, secure the position that I uh, got in February as Queen's Bard of the East. So let's, uh, let's dive in. Let's talk about what a lute is. Um, a lute is a plucked instrument with a round back, a long neck, gut strings, and gut frets. I'm going to show you a picture, though the picture I'm going to show you is actually not a lute. Um, picture I'm going to show you is actually an oud, and I'm going to talk about the oud because those they are very uh, closely related instruments. Let me dig in here. So here, uh, if you could verify for me that you guys can, are seeing the screen I'm showing you, there is a, a diagram here. Are you guys seeing it? Hi, Bradley, and welcome. I know you guys. Excellent, thank you. Um, Bradley, we're, we're in progress. I'll break for questions periodically, but if you could stay on mute, I am recording, so you know I am, I am uh, video recording this. So trust me, if you don't consent to that, then I invite you to simply uh, not, not speak up. But I trust that it's probably not gonna be an issue. I wanna be able to share this on YouTube afterwards. So the, here, is the, here is the basic anatomy of an oud but a lute is very closely uh, related. We'll talk about the relationship in a moment. The one big difference is you'll notice that an oud, the oud here does not have any frets, does not have any crossbars on the neck, um, which is the big difference between that and a lute. 
A lute has frets on it, just like a guitar does. The ones on a, on a traditional lute were made of gut and they were movable because you constantly had to adjust it to get the tuning and tuning is one of the great challenges of playing lute. But this is, this is the fundamentals, right? Your pick guard, your, your soundboard, your sound hole, which on a lute is often covered with rosettes, uh, a cool grid that's very decorative and uh, affects a little bit the way the sound comes out. But otherwise, you'll notice it looks a lot like a guitar. You've got your pegs and your nut and your neck and your strings. It's all basically the same with the crucial difference that the body of a traditional lute is a half eggshell shape, rounded. Um, and that makes it a little tricky to work with, but it's gorgeous. And it has these wooden ribs on the back that really make it a, almost an objet d'art in its own right. So that is uh, that. That's sort of the look of it. The big thing that distinguishes it, as I said, is that is the round neck, the gut strings and frets. Um, I, some people call it a descendant of the African or Middle Eastern oud, which was referred to, I believe, in Arabic as aloud, and hence the it evolves into lute as it moves into Europe. Um, to say descendant, though, implies that the oud does not continue a robust, healthy life of its own, which it does. It is uh, still a widely played instrument. Uh, as far as I know, the oud has never gone through a period where it essentially was extinct as an instrument, which the lute did. The lute essentially died out. We'll get to that in a moment. So I want to be careful about being too Eurocentric when I talk about it. Uh, the other thing to note is that the lute, in particular, is arranged in courses, which is to say pairs of strings that are either tuned to the same pitch or exactly an octave apart, except for the highest pitched string, the first course, also known as the chantelle. The traditional process when, you, when, uh, when they recommend how to tune a lute, because of course, this is all going on at a time before there are tuning forks, before there is any standardization really around tuning, is tune the chantelle as tight as you can that doesn't break it. And then tune down in intervals all the other strings. So the lute that I'm gonna probably talk more about which is the Elizabethan seven course lute had 13 strings on it, seven courses. So two bass notes, you know, two above that, two, two, and two, and then one on the top, which is where your, your top guitar string is, uh, which is typically in standard guitar tuning tuned to high E. Um, the medieval lute starts out around 1100 to, uh, to as late as 1500 has four to five courses, and it is typically played with a plectrum, not unlike a pick. Um, because that is the, the degree of the technology, the degree to which the strings could be developed to get enough tension for any volume, that was as many courses as they could really comfortably fit. Around the around 1500 or so, we begin to evolve into the Renaissance lute, and we add a sixth course. And around that same time, lutenists become really interested as music notation is evolving in polyphony, in being able to create harmony. And as they try to do that, the plectrum falls away and they start to switch to a finger picking style, a plucking style, which we'll go into more in a moment. Late Renaissance, around time of the Elizabethan era, mid mid 16th century, 1550 and so on, a seventh course gets introduced, but it's still relatively new. So Elizabethan music is getting composed. They start to incorporate this extra bass note because it's a deeper course that gets added, but it's a very deep note. It's used, but it's not used that heavily in most of these pieces, which is cool because of course the guitar only has six strings. So we'll talk a little bit about how you adapt in a moment. England comes into prominence in the 16th century. Published mu lute music becomes popular. The printing press is taking off and you have this period, the very end of our period of study, where there's a 25 year stretch from just before 1600. For the next 25 years, there are dozens of 
sh of, of sheet music, of lute tablature books published. John Dowland is the most famous, uh, probably second. Uh, it's Thomas Campion, two that I tend to focus heavily on. There's a number of others. And then the, um, and then the uh, Puritans kind of get involved and uh, they stomp it all into, uh, and stomp it out. It stops getting published. The instrument continues to evolve for the next couple centuries. And as the technology gets better, they keep adding more courses. I don't know if you've had a chance to ever see this. Hi, uh, Michelle, if you would do me a favor, I'm recording. We're going to keep going. I'm going to be posting the complete session on YouTube so you can catch anything you missed. And I'll be sharing out how to get the, uh, the class notes. But if you'd stay on mute until we hit a point for Q&A, we'll have some at the end. But I'm going to keep going. I'm doing a little history part now. So the loop continues to evolve and they keep adding more courses to it until the Baroque loot, you hit a point where it has something like 13 courses on it and they expand it out and they, it's now one, inter, the interval is like one step between every string. By about the late 18th century, people realize that's a lot of work to put into play an instrument that is not necessarily appreciably better than other instruments that you can play in the Baroque period. You might as well play a harpsichord or a piano at that point if you're going to have that degree of fidelity. And the loop dies out. Turn of the 19th century, the Germans find themselves going back through loop tablature pieces and say, hey, you know, this is a great instrument. We should really be able to do this. And they create the loop guitar using the technology that's used to make a guitar in that day with a loop body and with ornate heads so that it evokes that. Loot guitars continue to be made to this day, and we'll talk about that a little more when we talk about ways you can play and get your look and feel closer. Let me pause before we get into some of the nitty gritty of the how-to. Anyone have any questions, anything you wanna ask about before we get into that? Just about the history or about the nature of the instrument. Feel free to unmute if you wanna ask. Two, three, moving along. Okay. Um, so this is the big question, and, and, and I, I managed to get a certain amount of mileage out of offering the class, but the truth is most of what you need to know to be able to actually play loop music on a modern guitar. Um, but before we do that, actually, let me, ask, let me answer the question that some people are going to ask, because we're all about authenticity and historicity. So let's talk about why, right? Some of the reasons may be obvious, but... If you ever get any um, any feedback, if you ever get any pushback, why don't you just get a lute? Why are you playing on guitar? I'm going to offer up a few reasons why I do it. Even though I have a low-end lute, which still needs some work, um, I haven't started learning to play it directly yet. I still like to use lute guitars or guitars. Um, and I think it's a really good choice. It's a very sensible choice for people who are first learning. Uh, guitar as a start or its own endpoint has a number of advantages over the lute. Okay, obviously, they are much less expensive. Okay, lutes start in the four or five hundreds for a really, really cheap, potentially poor quality instrument. Okay, get a proper student quality lute can run you a grand. To get higher level, serious quality. You're talking in the thousands of dollars. And obviously not everybody always has that to shell out, especially if they haven't figured out if they really love the instrument. You know, guitars you can get for under a hundred dollars. Um, they're very easy to there that you can there's all sorts of places you can go to maintain them, replace pieces, replace the whole thing. Um, and of course, it's very easy to get lessons. Um, guitars use modern technology that is really, really easy to tune and keep in tune. An authentic period loop with wooden pegs is a very involved thing to tune and keep in tune. Now, there's a lot of people who may have planetary gears on a loop, but now you're compromising some of your authenticity anyway. There's all sorts of details about how to get a loop that uses wooden pegs to stay in tune. There's this uh, putty called peg dope that you can put on, but it's a lot of work. Playing courses instead of individual strings it's a slightly different skill set. The fingering positions are quite a bit farther apart. So the other pieces, guitars use modern technology. They give you volume. 
volume is definitely nice to have. You can fill a room with the sound of even a classical guitar, you know, which is using nylon strings instead of steel. And I recommend nylon. We'll talk about that in a minute. So in most SCA settings, a guitar is much easier to hear than a lute, which doesn't mean you should never use one. The lute is a distinct instrument. It has its own voice. There are reasons that are worth considering. Um, the two string courses and the wide neck give you tremendous subtlety. Once you develop the skill, you can play faster. The lute leaned into what it was good at. The double strings helped compensate for the relative lack of tension on the gut strings because they couldn't get too tense or they break. The double strings give you subtlety of voice and it's a speed instrument. The, the, the speed of play for people who have a classical guitar background, uh, I'm sure that you'll be able to, to acquire this quickly. But if you really play a lute, especially a well-made lute, you have this range of expression. And if you're in a quieter, smaller space that isn't going to be as difficult to fill where you're not competing with as much noise, um, it's amazing. And obviously it's unique look and sound potentially give you a much more immersive experience if you've learned to play it really well. And you know, if you want people to completely drop into the moment, there's no question. A modern guitar with the big shoulders, it's gonna take people out for a little bit. However, if you play well, if you lean into it, and I'll talk about the fact that if you want a guitar and you don't want the big shoulders, you want something that presents like a lute. Um, I have a couple of those, and I'll talk about how you get them. They're not that hard to come by. The price range is a bit, but it's under $1,000 for the stuff I'm talking about. Uh, there's, there's one I'll show you in a moment. You can get for a couple hundred bucks plus change since we're shipping. Why should you feel okay with playing lute music on a guitar? It is perfectly reasonable to learn period-appropriate music on a modern instrument. Okay, Six-string guitar is more similar to Renaissance lute than it is to any other instrument. Uh, you know, as, with the exception of an oud, which is trickier to play because of the lack of frets. But if, for a modern and affordable instrument, they are very close cousins. We'll talk in a moment about just how close and how easy it is to tune them. Compositions for lute translate to guitar with a little bit of study, some slight adjustments, but it's not at all hard to do. And indeed, lots of people have already done it. You will find there are guitar tab arrangements for Dowland and mostly for Dowland because he was definitely the most popular of them, but I found them on my guitar tab app. Um, I'm gonna teach you how to do more than that, how to work from real source. Um, and as I'm gonna talk to you about in a moment, there's a range of lute guitars which look more like a lute, but, are, but play like a guitar, meaning they're easy to tune. The, the fingering is more familiar. Uh, they're available to you. I think there's a lot of room for good enough. And indeed, if you take off those, those big shoulders, you can give a very immersive experience. I do almost, I, I, I've never played my lute out in public. I've only played lute guitar. But if you play it reasonably well, people are going to get into it. There may be some serious music buffs who are gonna ask, and I've been asked once or twice. I think it's a defensible decision. Don't get huffy about it because they're just asking because they're curious. Now, Let's get into nuts and bolts. This is the part that's shockingly easy, actually. A couple things I recommend. Um, if you're going to play lute music on guitar, this is my Ukrainian lute guitar. I'm going to demonstrate a couple things for you. There we go. Excellent. There we go. So this is bass. This is a guitar. Okay, it's not a round body. The Ukrainian lute guitar is a set about a couple hundred and change plus shipping. I found them online. Um, if, you, if you just search Ukrainian lute guitar, you will find various of these. They're reasonably well made. They're not, you know, heavy hitters. Mine came with steel strings on it. I restrung it with nylon. Um, I recommend nylon. Uh, if there's a reason classical guitar is strung with nylon. It is softer, it is gentler, it is much easier on the fingers if you're gonna be doing this kind of finger work. Ultimately, I've actually started uh, stringing with Nile Gut, which is a specialized product from the nylon family, but it is specially machined to emulate as closely as a modern synthetic material can the feel, the sound of gut. 
It's designed for instruments like lute. They do offer them for guitar. Um, I found, I think it's Aquila um, for a couple, three bucks more. Uh, I can get them, you can get them on Amazon. And this one I haven't strung with, but my uh, my more hot, my higher end Ruspec lute guitar, which has the full body, is currently strung with uh, Nile gut. I will probably string this with Nile gut when these nylon strings wear out. So this is um, this is standard modern guitar tuning that is currently, and and indeed I've been learning some guitar on it. But with this one, I like to sometimes play lute pieces as well. So here's what I do, right? G. E, sorry, A, D, G, right? G is your uh, your third string from the top, B, A. Let's go to the third string. The third string from the top typically is tuned to G, but the intervals on a lute are a little bit different. There's fourth intervals and a third and one third interval. On a lute, the third interval is one string over. So all I'm doing is I'm taking the third string, my G, I'm dropping it half a step to F sharp. And now I'm tuned for loop music. I can play loop music on here. It changes the shape of all the chords. It changes what I have to do with my fingers quite a bit. But if I wanna get real sticky because most Elizabethan loop music is written in G and this is currently tuned in E, that's what a capo is for. I can put it up to G, like so. And now with the correct fingerings. Sometimes I may find, especially if I'm gonna sing, and I'm gonna sing with this one, um, there is a standard, which is an understanding, as we said, that there is no one complete agreed upon tuning. These things weren't tuned in anything we specifically recognize. So uh, currently, right, A is a, a modern mid A is 440 hertz. But uh, for early music, where they assume that a lot of these instruments were tuned early, uh, a little lower, professional early music musicians tend to tune about a half a step down, which they often call A415, uh, which I can accomplish if I want by dropping the capo a step. Now I'm technically tuned in F sharp, but I'm also basically tuned in Baroque or early tuning G. And in the end, if you want to sing or you want your fingers to be at a place on the fretboard that are comfortable for you to play. Put, put the capo wherever you need. It really is fine. Do what serves the song, do what serves your learning process, do it without the capo as you prefer. You'll find as you, a lot of people are playing guitar for lute pieces and many of them are not using a capo because they're, the, the E tuning works fine for what they're singing. We'll do a little more of that in a moment. But as I said, so to be able to get it in tune, it's it's that simple. We'll do more with it a little bit. Everybody doing okay so far? You with me? Great. Now, that's that's all well and good, right? We uh, we understand how to tune it. Wow, that was actually really easy. You maybe come here for ninety minutes so that you could tell me that. But there's a little more to it. If you want to be able to research and find music, especially there's a lot of music that is, you said you can find tablature arrangements. A quick sense, uh, ping with a quick message if you are not familiar with tablature. Because I can take a moment to briefly explain it. I'll, I'll just for context, since some of the people watching might not know, tablature is basically a notation that is designed to mechanically show you how to play. Yeah, I figured. I figured you would. Um, to mechanically show you how to play, and you do it 
because it shows you, you know, where to put your fingers relative to either the nut or where your capo is, right? And which string, what strings to sound, what strings to leave blank. Um, modern guitar tablature uses uh, numerals, you know, standard numbers. A zero means it's an open string. A one means you place a finger and you, and you hold down the first fret. Two means you hold down the second fret, etc. Really, really easy to learn and use. Um, very handy. Guitar tablature evolved from some of the forms of tablature used for loop music because, again, they were super similar. And I'm going to show you just a few examples. There were three dominant tablatures that were in play uh, as loot evolved. Let me share this so you can see it. Yes, 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 maybe, maybe, maybe. I'm having, there we are, because I was looking in the wrong place. Oh, my. Sorry for the delay. So, so here we have Italian tablature, which looks an awful lot like modern guitar tablature. Um, the big difference, no, actually, it, it's very similar, right? In that, because uh, typically, I think in modern guitar tablature, you put the symbols right on the string, so it's really obvious. However, the weird thing about Italian tablature as it existed in the, the day, um, for some reason, they felt it was going to be more intuitive if the bottom, the bottom line represented the top line, the, the sort of vertical mirror of your instrument. And the top line represented the deepest, lowest string. So this is not showing you how to place your hand. And that can be counterintuitive for a lot of people. Um, German tablature is its own special thing because German, nothing against Germans. Um, but it never really traveled much outside of Germany because the symbology and the mix of symbols just, no, not doing it. French tablature, um, got very popular. It certainly was, uh, predominantly used in England. Um, and French tablature used a bit of an alphabeta technique where lowercase letters were used to represent the, the, the notes and the finger positions. A would be open string. B would be first fret. C would be second fret and so on. If you go as high as I, you need to bear in mind there is no J because J wasn't a letter at the time. Um, it would go straight to K, but I don't think so far I've come across a whole lot of tablature that really tends to take you that high up on the take that high up on the fretboard. Um, French lute tablature is then what we're going to focus in on. It's what I learned. And that looks in practice um, a little like this. This is John Dowland. Uh, Come again, sweet love, don't now invite, which is a piece that uh, one of the first pieces I actually learned to understand how to play tablature and it was a bit of work for me at the time to understand and map it and realize it was a one-to-one -one that the the if i move in real close on that first line that what we have here is now this has one two three four five six and there's a spot below the sixth where occasionally there will be a note a seventh note but i don't have seven strings we'll talk about what to do for that but i can Come again, sweet love doth now invite thy graces that refrain to do me do delight. Just to give you a taste. The question then is, as you're taking this up, as you're first learning it, what do you do? Um, when I first started to learn it, I tended to uh, dodge that question. I, I dealt with that question by translating the tablature into guitar tab. Um, you know, I would, I would write it out by hand. And 
the teacher who offered me that first download piece, she sent me not um, not that that I just showed you. She sent me a version that was a little easier to read. You will find there are lots of variations. Oh, sorry. I didn't show you the tab example rather than the download. Sorry about that. Let me fix that real quick. I thought I had fixed it, but one second, because I definitely want you to see it. Oh, come on. One more share, present, window. Ah, uh, right. It when you say a window, it is a specific window. My apologies. I can't just switch between. Hopefully you're seeing this now. So this is, I'm going to take a moment to break this down a little bit. It's all right, because uh, I have to love this. This is really interesting. It's fascinating. Um, if you look up real close, you'll notice this is not, this is not transcribed, this is not scribed. This is typeset. So there's special typesetting being used, and you can notice it from the unevenness for the notes. Um, this is menstrual notation, very close to modern uh, music notes, though they're using a specific clefs, contus clef, a soprano clef, which can be translated into modern treble. Um, but here, as I said, so here was the um, the come again, sweet love, A A C C, zero zero two two, open strings, and second fret, break through. These flags give you a sense of the value, how long each of the notes is, um, and you get that gist here. I just wanted to get you give you a sense of what it looks like. You will often find that you may encounter not this you may encounter something else. Um, when you go looking, you may find something that looks similar to that, but looks a little more modern, a modern translation, if you will, because somebody has transcribed it, partly because that facsimile, that's a facsimile of the original, um, of the original songbook. And indeed, a lot of that music is available. All of Download is available in facsimile. I like working from there because I'm working from a primary source. If you find it in facsimile, that's a great place to start. If you find a, a transcription of it, you might choose to go and track down, if you can find it, the original facsimile, and just do a true up. Go through and sort of compare it as you get comfortable with this. If you want, you can go note by note to say, is this person really transcribing what was on the original page? And I'll show you, let me see if I can find a good example of that um, so that we can just sort of give you a, one second, no, nah, that's not going to be it, one second. My apologies, I thought I had this ready. So here we go. I'm going to share with you an example of a transcription that is, that is almost certainly serviceable. Um, no, that's not the one. Where is it? There we go. Yes, no. Um, are you seeing my sweetest lesbia? Or am I showing the wrong thing? I'm assuming nobody's shining in, so I'm probably showing you the right thing. These are just some examples of... This is a songbook of, of, of Campion music. He is hard to get a hold of in the original. I've tracked down a few of them. But if you have this, you're dealing with something that is being rendered in a little more modern and translatable way. But notice we have at heart, right? We have, it's, it's, it's French tablature. It's a little cleaner and easier to read. You can print this out. You probably learn from this. Um, once you've played with a few pieces, doing the mental math of having to take that one string off because A is zero, not one, um, you'll learn to do it. You don't have to. I said, I want to say, I am always a champion of do what you want where you are. If you're here, it's because presumably you're interested in finding out more about loop music. And ultimately, a great way to learn loop music is to get familiar with loop tablature. It's really not, it's not that hard. As I said, it's a really simple way to explain how to play it. Um, the flags take a little getting used to, but as with flags on standard notes, the more flags, the shorter the note is. 
I usually will, for me, I will go and track either track down uh, a recording or a video on YouTube and I will listen to it a bit. A tool that I sometimes also use um, is transcription software. I'll quickly show you a little bit of that, uh, if I may. There is a free program. Uh, French tablature is not mirrored like Italian. Italian's the only one that does that. French tab is basically just like modern guitar tab, but with letters instead of numbers. Okay. Uh, did I switch us over? I'll, I'll, let me make sure. I want to make sure that I'm that I'm presenting the thing that I want to present. I want to just show you really quickly. Um, I want to show you MuseScore. Um, I work with this a ton because I actually transcribe like my music. But as an example, I'm going to quickly find one. Hopefully, quickly. Um, there we go. Hold on. Songs, loop music. Here we go. So this is a piece I started to play for you earlier, Clear or Cloudy. They had a transcription of this with tablature. MuseScore 3 has support for uh, early instruments. So it can present this as French tab. In fact, you can enter something as French tab or find it in French tab and then change how it displays so that it displays Italian style, but without flipping everything. They don't do it so that everything's backwards. Uh, it's not mirrored here. This is the right way and the right lengths. I ultimately worked through and found places I wanted to simplify this piece. This is called Muse Score. Um, I believe I my class notes include it. It is free. It is available on pretty much every platform. Um, it's really simple. I mean, it's not trivially simple. There is an online component that has a uh, repository of scores, which included a version of Clear and Cloudy. I, I started from that. But then I worked on it, checked it against my source, because they had made some changes. Some of the changes, I realized, were good choices. Uh, they simplified some of the lines because the guitar only has six strings. Dowlin's original arrangement starts a bit lower on the seventh course, which was for a progression that goes up, and I'll play the piece for you in a little bit so you can hear it, um, there's a progression that kind of goes up chromatically. And we can't start that low. Substituting out makes no sense because it's about going from deep to higher. So the guy who transcribed this took out the bottom note and put in a note on top so that it's the same notes, but they're starting on the sixth string of the guitar. The effect is the same. So I ultimately made the decision it was a valid uh, substitution. But doing your own research like that is the only way to really make sure. The other piece as we get into it is, um, what do you do if there's a note or two on the seventh string, the seventh course that you can't put on a guitar? You have two major choices. You can drop it out, or you can, if you have the music theory, you can you know, transpose it up an octave, figure out where that goes, and then play that string. So you're still getting the harmony. You're getting the right, the right uh, polyphony. Um, that is what I do most of the time when I have the choice. And I know I'm wandering around a little bit. Let me take a moment, look back at my notes to make sure that I haven't missed anything important. A couple things now as you try to play, right? We've talked about how to tune it. I just talked about uh, what to do in terms of a transcription. Um, bear in mind that, uh, so the style is somewhat similar to your finger style or classical guitar. It's probably gonna feel a little, um, little blockier sometimes. Uh, generally the pinky is anchored on the soundboard with the right hand and you wanna strive for an inward plucking motion with each finger, which may or may not be what you're doing with classical guitar, but so, Helps if I actually. Come on. Ah, don't embarrass me. I was doing so well. But that sort of thing. Um, a classical guitar itself is a really good instrument to do loose loop pieces on because this is all a little wider. It gives you more room for your fingers. The other loop guitar I have, which was designed for nylon strings, has a classical neck. 
So it is rather, it allows me to get more delicacy. Um, I put in the chords myself actually on that particular piece because I just thought it was, sometimes you, you, you can do that because you want somebody who maybe is just wants to strum and do a simple version, just wants to play the chords. It isn't necessary. If I'm doing a straight lute piece, I'm just going to be using the tablature. But sometimes when they're doing these arrangements, they want to leave it open for various audiences um, so that you, it operates as a lead sheet or as a, um, you know, or as a, uh, you know, standard piece of sheet music. So far so good. So uh, the other thing to note, usually because the chord shapes are totally different, uh, in most loop music, you are all you're rarely sounding more than three or four notes together. So you're not as a, that's why you're plucking instead of strumming. Um, you're usually going to be using some of the fingers up here, some of the fingers up here. It's rare that you need to get all six uh, strings at once. You can do a strum for that. You can sort of cross pluck a little bit to get that effect. Um, and sometimes if it's a, a key thing to this, as with any other instrument, is recognizing when it's right, when is the right time to simplify. The piece that I was doing before, Clear or Cloudy, um, it's very challenging for me. Uh, it's, uh, Dowland can get very challenging. He is uh, contrapuntal. And compared to Prius, uh, compared to previous attempts that I had done when I was competing, I used to try and do pretty much every note. And it meant that if I was in over my head, especially I, I, I've only been playing this for like four and a half years, which, you know, for an adult isn't that long. And for this level of, of complexity is not that long. I have to put in a lot of time to get these pieces under my belt. But that doesn't mean because I was a masochist, you should be. Um, there are various pieces. Campion as a rule is a little simpler. It's a great place to start. Uh, there are some Dowling pieces that are harder than others. There are a number of different composers out there. And as you learn a piece, as you start getting comfortable with the basics of it, you're putting it together, you'll notice there's something you're really having trouble playing. And if you know that where you are relative to when you want to do a performance or just you feel right now where you are, I am not going to get that. I'm not going to figure it out. Maybe one day I'll come back and I'll be able to redo it. The first couple of pieces I actually tried, I only did one or two of the notes in the line. Um, I kept them simple and it made it possible for me to perform them. Um, now I try to learn the full arrangement, but I also recognize that bottom note is messing me up. It is just messing me up. There's a note I have to add in here and it drives me crazy and I've spent a day on it. I'm taking that note out because no one's going to miss it. Most people don't know all the details of the piece. And the ones who do, um, serious you know, professional level musicians who play in the SCA, they do it too. And they will respect you. You know, If you choose when explaining a piece you're doing to someone who's at that level to talk about those decisions you made consciously. And my blog posts about Clear and Cloudy, I actually break it down month by month as I work the piece. I have like five separate posts breaking down how I learned the piece, where I had to stop and sort of re-break the leg. Um, that's what the essay is all about, is sharing that kind of knowledge. They will respect that. It is, it, is, it is a good thing to do, and there's nothing wrong with making those choices so that in the end, I focused on what would give the best performance and dropping out certain notes that were going to stumble. I don't want to stumble. I want to be focused. I want to be polished. Eventually, I wanted to make as much eye contact as I could with the audience. And I got to a place where I made a reasonable amount of eye contact as I played and sang. But if I think I'm going to hit the wrong string, I'm going to look at my instrument because that is going to be more distracting than, oh gosh, he keeps looking down. Yeah, looking down is not as great as just looking everybody in the eye and playing it. But this is harder than most other things. Certainly for me, and I have no great guitar skills. I'm actually learning guitar now. I mean, I took some lessons years ago. I had a bass line. So I know, again, I'm being a little scattered. We're most of the way there. So um, we've talked about uh, looking at sources. I'll talk more about where to find them. 
remember that SCA it generally considers music published as late as 1650 to be acceptably period. And um, I'm just going to give you an example. We, I was talking about how Elizabethan lute music uh, shows up at the very end of the 16th century. Dowland first publishes in 1597. That does not mean Dowland wasn't composing before that. He totally was. Um, there is a reason that all of this Elizabethan English lute music shows up so late, which has nothing to do with when it was appropriate. It has to do with intellectual property rights. Um, England had a royal patent, a 20 year royal patent that was granted to one person who got the only musical printing press in the country and exclusive rights to publish music. No one else was allowed in England, in all of Britain. And uh, William Byrd, who had those rights for 20 years, he did a lot of instruments. He was not a big lute guy. He didn't publish lute music. In 1596, his patent expires and Thomas East uh, takes it over. And East goes, I think there is an unmet demand here, which is one of the reasons that William Byrd went, uh, left the business without really making any money. He wasn't publishing stuff that was popular. He reaches out to his friend, John Dallin, and says, dude, you got great music. Would you, do you want to do this? In 1597, the first book of songs or airs is published. It goes into four printings. It is the only loot book, uh, even if Downland's, that was that popular. But clearly there was an unmet demand. And very quickly, he starts finding other musicians and getting their stuff typeset and publishing it. And so those things go out for the next uh, for the next twenty years or so, so there's p stuff that's po that's published after Elizabeth dies, but it, a lot of it's backlog, a lot of it's stuff that couldn't get published any earlier, which is why this stuff is acceptable. So please know that. As I've mentioned, the gold standard for being able to say that you really got a primary source on this is if you can find a version of it in facsimile, right? That which you know, see so that looks like it was photographed off of a printed page. You can learn stuff from there because it is readable, but it's tricky, um, especially because I think the lowercase c's and the lowercase e's are, uh, they, they look a lot alike. So be aware of that. So um, once you look at it carefully, you can figure them out. So you certainly can, if, if you choose, find a transcription and then just use this as a baseline to see, is the transcriber accurate? Are they doing the right thing? If so, let's use the transcription because it's easier to read. Um, where do you find the kinds of music you want? You can go to YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, all sorts of places. Anywhere that, that publishes music, you can search for a composer. John Dowland, Thomas Campion, and Robert Morley are probably three of the best known Elizabethan ones. There are many, many others. Um, I will send you a link to my, um, to my online notes in a moment. That has a few other links. The Internet Music Score Library Project. The ISM, IMSLP or the Petrucci Music Library is a phenomenal source of historical music. The Choral Public Domain Library is another one. I also have a personal library of tablature that I found from sources that I will share if you, uh, if you reach out to me. So deep breath for me. I got it in under the hour, but as I said, there is time. So for those of you who are still here, if we want to have more of a conversation, if you'd like me to demonstrate uh, a little of this on a piece, feel free to unmute and, and, and let's talk for a moment. I don't, I don't want to send you off feeling that you didn't get what you came for. Anybody have any questions? Uh, technical question on uh, the switching up the strings. I mm -hmm. was led to believe that stringing a steel string guitar with nylon strings or vice versa was bad for the neck. Is there some sort of process you go through or special strings or? There wasn't like for that? me. Now, crucially, this was brand new. When I got it brand new. Mm -hmm. I did a little bit of research, and it is quite possible. I suspect it is. I suspect, and I can't say I know, but I've had this one now for a couple of years. Um, th it's definitely true that for certain kinds of instruments, they don't play as well. I used to use a Martin Backpacker, which, of course, doesn't have the big shoulders, but it doesn't produce big sound either. You know, it's a little mm -hmm. tricky that way. Um, and replacing the steel strings on it with uh, nylon resulted in something that really didn't project. Um, this, 
as I said, I took the steel strings off as soon as I got it and I put nylon on it. And the truth is this is an acoustic neck, which is a little tight. So it is a little tricky to play these pieces on it. Yeah, I'll stumble more on this, although the, you know, I'm doing less finger exercise, but let me, let me take you through a little bit of clear cloudy if I may. I'm gonna take it back down so that it's still in that range, but it doesn't strain my voice as much, all right? Let me just sing. Clear or cloudy, sweet as April showering, smooth or frowning, so is her face to me. Pleased or smiling, like mild May all flowering, when sky is blue silk and meadows carpets be. Her speech as notes of that night bird that singeth, oh, oh, oh sweet yet jarring notes out ringeth. Her speech as notes of oh, that night bird that singeth. Oh, 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 sweet, yeah, jarring notes out ringeth. Couple things to note. A piece of that was my definitely being a little out of practice on the piece because I haven't been playing it regularly since I've been doing guitar. But the other thing about it is most of the time I've been play I, I tend to play my lute stuff on on my uh, my Ruspec, which has a bigger body, which has a, uh, a classical guitar neck. So there is more space. There's more stumbling happening here for me. Um, that doesn't mean, and especially if it's what you're learning on, you'll get used to it. Um, but I have not found a problem with the neck. I suspect putting steel strings on a classical guitar is probably more, uh, is probably kind of problematic because the, the neck isn't built with the strength for the tension that steel strings put on it. Um, yep. From what I've heard, I don't think the the biggest challenge I think with putting nylon on steel on a on an acoustic guitar is that an acoustic guitar has not necessarily been built with a with a with a soundboard designed to push the more the greater amplification than mm. the lower tension nylon strings need. Um, as it would, in the case of the Ruspec, the Ruspec was designed for nylon strings. So, and it has that big bowl body, which really puts the stuff out there. Um, I'll, I, I can um, attach to the YouTube for this, uh, maybe a link or two to me playing um, that here. Let's see if I can quick find it. Anyway, while I take a quick look and see if I can spot one in case you guys want to see it, uh, what other questions do you have, if any? Yeah, as I said, I'm not going to claim I'm great shakes at this. What we're doing here is challenging. Um, and done well, especially well prepared, it can be quite beautiful. And I'm going to see if I can quickly find the recording of my performance at uh, Queens and Crowns of that piece from a couple months ago. Tuning diagram in class notes. Um, The class notes do include a little bit of High level stuff. I do have, uh, there is a piece that shows you all of the different voicings for how to play different chords. And I can make sure that I, I, I will track that down and uh, make it available. What I'll do is the current version of the notes are a PDF, but I also can, I can set up a page for that, which will give me room to add more content to it. I'll try to do that this week. Um, for now, let me send you a link to my class notes page right now. I'm going to post it, as I said, with the YouTube. But if you click here, you'll see class notes for several of my classes, and the, the bottom one is Guitarist Persona as a Lute, which will include the outline of everything I've covered so far today. And as I said, I will at some point go and uh, I'll, I'll set it up as its own page so that I can add other content uh, to ca capture things that aren't on here. Real quick, um, let me find... There it is, there it is, there it is. All right, here... For those of you who wish to see it, is 
this is clear cloudy um and why not let's let's throw it up if i can and we'll uh see if we can experience it together because i think it comes out okay one moment one moment let me see if i can uh if i can present this out Yeah, this is the Roo spec. Can you guys hear it? No, I wasn't hearing it. All right. Then that's obviously not helping anybody. I've sent no. you the link. I'm being silly. So we'll stop there. As I said, um, I will include the link on the, on the YouTube, but you guys have it. You can check it out. Because um, you get a sense of what it looks like and how it feels and how it sounds and how it fills space, which is nice. Sorry, there's probably a way to do it and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it now. All right, uh, any other questions? I said, I'm glad we had the extra time so that people don't have to rush out if they don't want to. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank um, you. Feel free, if, uh, if you don't know me, I'm on Facebook. If you search for Drake Orenwood, you will come up with me. Uh, my mundane name is Eric Schrager. Um, and you should feel free to, to connect with me there. Um, you can check out, as I said, my blog in general is at that website, drakethebard.com. There's contact information there as well. Other class notes and videos for all of, pretty much all the loot stuff I've done, as well as other stuff. So, I do have a question. Yeah. All right, you showed us uh, modern music and converted to loot notation. What about uh converted to uh modern tablature modern guitar tablature oh okay um will, some, will anything do that oh yeah well you can do that you can do that music score can do both so if you set up if you set up your staff for loot tablature mm -hmm. and you put mm -hmm. in the notes using the letters then you can once that's done i'll show uh, 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 let me take a moment to show you exactly what that looks like um, because that's that's worth seeing. It's, it's it's really not hard at all. MuseScore has some really good online documentation as well. I, I really can't for a free program. I really can't recommend it highly enough. If you have the music theory, and therefore you're comfortable, uh, let me share this out with you real quick. I'll show you what I mean. Because you can go you can go both directions that way. Um, I use it for recorder stuff all the time. Sure. As I said, it's, um, I've been playing with it recently. I finally figured out how to do fretboard diagrams on it because I've been trying, now that I'm really learning guitar in earnest, I'm realizing that some of my original compositions, I want to learn to play them and I want other people to be able to play them. And some of the chords I pick are tricky. So I wanted to put fret fretboard diagrams on them. So here's the, right. So here's the, um, so if I go to staff properties, right. Um, let me see, where is the, where's the piece? Uh, that's not it. That's not it. I know there's a piece that shows me how to present it. It's not edit string data. Just give me a second. It's, it's been a little bit. Um, hang on, hang on, hang on. I know that, ah, advanced style properties. Here we are. Uh, so advanced style properties, the number of lines, right? Um, note values. Uh, come on, come on. I know there's a place where I can switch the, um, I, where I can switch between, it's just been a little while. No, I don't want that. Dang it. If I need to, I will follow up because at the moment it's just not, it's, it's really, it is really, really solid software. I swear to you on my life. And, um, I don't think it's changed a guitar. I know there's a set of, of properties that let you specify, but it's not here. I'm trying to remember where it is on the where it is on the uh, staff part properties. No, that's not it. I apologize. Um, I wasn't quite expecting 
that that was going to be the depth we were going to go into, but I'm glad. I said, there is an option here that lets you specify how the tablature is being displayed. I'm just blanking on where it is. I know that if you go to the online help, there's a place that does show it to you. There's even this whole thing with transposition. I'm just, hang on. No. Why Do you have your online, um, your pieces on the online repository or have you chosen? Uh, yes, so those? my website, all of my pieces are on there. Yeah, almost everything I ha I've done, I have sheet music that I generated using this software. Um, as I said, some of the more advanced features like the fretboard diagrams I've only just started using, but where I can, I, I've started putting those in. I'll just, as, as an example, uh, here, I'll close this, which will stop it sharing. And here, if you go, if I take you to, to the website, here's an example, um, so we have the time window. There we go. So here we are. This is my website. If I go to Bardic work, this is stuff I have, mostly stuff I've written, but also stuff I've played. So here's clear cloudy. It's an example. I include videos of the piece. This one, as I said, because I spent some months learning it, I did introduction and I did a sequence where I broke out, broke out the nature of the work. Um, where you can find parts of it. As I worked through it, um, I ended up doing, here we go, reviewing and revisions, if I remember correctly. Uh, I end up spending some time showing, here's, here's the Dowland original. And here was, uh, I think this is actually a slightly earlier version of, of what I built using it. And as I said, I use the, the modern approach. Um, you know, I don't generally share out the raw uh, MZ, MSZ uh, scores because most people don't really need that. However, if I get the feeling that there's demand for that and people would like that, uh, not my copyrighted stuff, but certainly stuff like this, that's basically public domain. I can put the music, the, the Muse score versions on here for you to play with if you want. I have no issue with that because what I'm doing, I got from another source and then I tinkered with it. Um, mm -hmm. Here, the, a couple things to note too. One thing that I, I, I will wanna make sure when I create a page for this and I add more content to it, that's worth noting is um, time signatures uh, usually are not noted in the original notation. So Dowland especially is really creative and funky with his time signatures and and he doesn't note that he there is a time signature listed at the start of the song right it's either three four or cut time which basically should be two four or common time which is four four almost everything they do is in those ranges but along the way he will have a measure break maybe and if you really take the time to count it out the reason you're having trouble learning it is because that is not the number of beats that he advertised at the, at the front of the box. There's now six beats instead of four. He switched up on you to either three, four or six, eight. And it doesn't say that in the, in the sheet. Part of the thing about those two, those, those uh, folio style sheets, that's fun. On the right hand side, I'm gonna show this to you one more time. On the right hand side of the classic tablature, and I actually did a project where I emulate this. Um, I'll show you that because I can get to it quicker. Um, I, I, for, I, I, I have composed a piece that was done in Elizabethan style for Luton Voice. And I it worked hard to um, create period style, uh, a period style sheet book, which I show here. Let me... Where is it, where is it, where is it? Ah, here we go. So I built this. Starting, this is built in, in MuseScore, right? Um, I then did some actual digital editing to get it mensural looking to make it as authentic as possible. Because on the right hand side, you have your altus part upside down, your bass sideways, and your tenor right side up. Because what they're doing is they built this at a time when not too many people can afford these books. 
they want to present them in a way that makes them super easy to for to get one copy and with one copy you lay it out on the table you get your five musicians your lead singer and you know your lead singer is looking at it right up right side up your lutenist is looking at it right side up your tenor is looking at right side up, but over on the side, you've got your out, your bass and your alto, and all of you are sharing one songbook, but you can all work on the piece together, theoretically. It's tricky because there's no measure notation for these. There's, this is all about conserving space. You can see the focus on economy so that you can get a song into two pages so that you can get as many songs as possible into a relatively small folio book. Sometimes if there, were, if there aren't as many parts, they packed two songs on the same page. But it also means that when you're digging into certain details, um, I didn't change uh, time signatures here, but if Dowlin changes time signature, he doesn't tip you off necessarily. Um, however, the transcriptions that you find, they will, they will, they will change over. So when I tran when I worked on Clear Cloudy, over time I realized I needed to capture those time changes because under because thinking about it that way made it easier to learn and play properly, um, you know. And so some versions had it one way. So there's not always one right way to to translate them when they're complex. The key is: does it make sense to you? Does it flow properly for you musically? Um, if it does, you're probably getting close enough to the intention. Anything else? I want to thank you all for your time and your attention. Um, I appreciate the questions. I appreciate y'all coming. As I said, I will be uh, I will share out this recording on YouTube within the next few days. And um, thank you, everybody. <laughs>